the international voice of world evangelism, bringing to you the revelation of Jesus Christ. Welcome to this production by Jesus Christ, Eternal Kingdom of Abundant Life. Journey with us back through the barriers of time and join with the children of God who have entered into the spiritual world of the mind of Christ, brought forth through the inspired Word of God. We now present the everlasting gospel of Jesus Christ, brought forth by our beloved brother, Reverend George Leon Pike. I once saw Jesus through the books that I had read and I once saw Jesus by the life that he'd lived but you know something I now see Jesus by the life that he is now living before me that I may know the way to go behold a door is open this morning and uh, nobody has opened the door any wider than this man of God is about to come up here this morning brother George Pike let's welcome this great Marvelous man of God. Praise the Lord. Well, I'd say that I'm glad to be here. Uh, I really appreciate I appreciate that. I really do. I, I appreciate it so much. The welcome, the hearty welcome. And uh, the wonderful people that you really are. Like uh, the years you've labored and told and erected a <clears throat> something that's a monumental praise to God around the world. Paul said your faith is spoken of throughout the world. Pardon me, indeed it is. As a matter of fact, it was just yesterday that they brought a new translation to me. The one in the Russian language, Keys to Faith. Uh, we have one Russian translation called the Little Glass Slipper, but they just come off the press with one Keys to Faith. And uh, it was a real nice work. And it's your labor where it has gone around the world. It's like feathers in the wind. And uh, properties, buildings, and whatever, machineries, they're paid for where you told and believe God and, and it's been a testimony and people from all over the world want to come. They write and uh, it's such a thrill to be a part of something that God is doing around the world. So we're here this morning to worship God, to give him glory and to lift him up and to magnify him little sign that we just put up outside a new sign that we put up out there it says enter his gates with thanksgiving and into his courts with praise I noticed they didn't have it on this morning I would have thought they would have turned it on but they didn't but anyway that's what it's for it's to welcome you to little Bethlehem the home of the soul because indeed it is the home of the soul and here we're actively engaged in world evangelism and to feed the orphans and the widows and to do something for God, for the Bible says, pure and undefiled religion before God and the Father is to visit the widows and the orphans in their afflictions and then to keep yourselves unspotted from the world. And that's what we're trying to do. Paul said we're here as the ministry. Ah, oh, we wish this even the perfecting of your faith and I seek to present you body, soul, and spirit blameless before God. Not only do I want to present you spiritually blameless before God, I want to present you in your soul blameless before God, and I want to help you to bring your body under subjection to where I can present you in the body blameless to God because you're to be the bride of Christ, and that bride must be without spot, without wrinkle, and without blemish. So then it's our privilege to be here and be in the midst of you. And as Solomon of old said, uh, who am I or God? I'm not adequate for the purpose as to speak to so great a people. And when you say that, you know, you say, well, people are just people, Brother Pike, around the world. And uh, people speak to them all the time. Different leaders and the ecclesia of the world. But see, it's different with God's people. When Solomon said, 
you know who can address God's people it's different so great a people because God's people are gods they're not human beings they are gods they pass from death unto life to live forever and they are gods and uh, who is adequate for the purpose of speaking to gods and therefore he said I have called ye gods so you are also the friend of God for he said a man that's just a man or a woman they don't know what their master does but I've called you friends because I've told you what I'm going to do will I do anything without revealing it to my prophets or revealing it to my friend Abraham seeing that they will command their household after me so then it's just a privilege to be here this morning and to receive the Godship and you know this is one thing that we need to keep in mind something I was mentioning to David Paul this morning we are in a contest in this world and in this world this great mighty contest is a continual battle between the body and the soul or the spirit and there are within this world sons of God and in God that's neither male nor female so in this world there are sons of God but in this world there are sons of Satan and the Bible speaks of some being of Satan said you are of your father the devil his will he will do for to have the love of the world in you the love of the father isn't there and uh, there's a contest, and the contest is between the intellectual brilliance and power of world diplomacy and the mind of Christ, which is your biblical indoctrination. And uh, this contest is there because Satan, through Adam, is contesting this, the first man Adam, as contrary to the second man Adam, which is contesting this as to which one owns the body and whichever one owns the body owns the world and eternity and so then there's a contest as to being about our father's business and proving that we are the owners and the others are squatters that we are the wheat and they are the tare you are the just and they are the unjust and that the world and all that was created for Adam as when he was called the son of God before he lost his identity to the fall to bring forth those unto death it is that God has restored that to bring you back to the originality for the sonship to dispute that you might went out through Calvary and prove that you are heirs and join heirs with Jesus Christ and that all things belong to you and the others are nothing but problems and troublemakers and soon God will completely do away with them. Well, anyway, it's good to be here in this dispute and uh, know that we're winning out through Christ, that we're predestined as the children of God to win out no matter what might happen. I welcome you this morning to be here with us. I know we've got some visitors here, and I welcome you. Uh, yesterday I met Brother Steve Hudson and he and his wife family are here to the mo or this morning and uh, they came with Brother Clyde from Macon. They were in our tent meeting down there. And uh, maybe there's some others that are here, but if you're here visiting with us this morning, we're certainly glad to have you. I noticed that Myron and Grace is back. They uh, come back and uh, they've come from a, a terrible ordeal, but they're back and I'm certainly glad that they're back at home and that all is well. And uh, all of the others that are here, we love you, appreciate you, we thank God for you. There was a number of them that were supposed to be here this morning. I thought that maybe Danny was going to be here, and Judy, and maybe Joe and Randy, and uh, uh, maybe Michelle and Dane. I'm not just sure who is here, who is not, but we're glad to have them here. I hope that Cynthia is here, and I hope that Susie is here. Whether they are or not, I don't know. Some of them I know they're not here, so the children, some are. But anyway, let's sing a little chorus together, can we? <clears throat> let's sing the song, Brother Taylor, Without Him I Can Do Nothing. So without Him I can do nothing. 
nothing and without him I would but fail and without him I would be drifting just like a ship without any sail can you sing it with me oh Jesus sweet Jesus you're in today no turn Can you sing it with me again? So without him you can do nothing And without him you would but fail And without Drifting just like a seal without any sail. Sing it with me now. Oh, Jesus, sweet Jesus, you're in today. No turn him my way Jesus so Jesus without him how lost I would be let's sing this little chorus let us enter these gates with thanksgiving down in the heart and enter into his courts with praise let us say this is the day the Lord hath made want to rejoice cause Jesus made me glad oh my Lord made me Oh, my Lord made me glad I'm gonna rejoice Cause Jesus made me glad My Lord made me glad Oh, my Lord made me glad And I'm gonna rejoice Cause Jesus made me glad Sing it with me now We've entered into the gates with thanksgiving down in the heart, we have entered into courts with praise. Sing, this is the day that the Lord hath made. Gonna rejoice, cause Jesus made me glad. And I'm gonna rejoice, Jesus made me glad. Oh, my Lord made me glad. Oh, my Lord made me glad. And I'm gonna rejoice. Sing it once more with me. Let us enter into the gate with thanksgiving down in the heart. Can you praise Him this morning? Can you love Him this morning? Can you enter into his gates for thanksgiving? That's the only way to get into his presence is to praise your way into it. John was down and he was illuminated and saw the wonderful revelation of Jesus Christ. Can you see it this morning?
pray that God will grant unto you the spirit of revelation. The translation is taking place and you don't want to miss it. Can you say hallelujah? Hallelujah. Just cause Jesus made me glad. So I'll enter into the gates with thanksgiving in my heart and I'll enter into the courts with praise and I'll save the sins the day that my Lord hath made and I'm gonna rejoice. Jesus, sing it with me now. Oh, my Lord made me glad Oh, my Lord made me glad And I'm gonna rejoice Cause Jesus made me glad Jesus made me glad Oh, Jesus made me glad And I'm gonna rejoice Can you sing it one more time? So we've entered into the gates With thanksgiving in the heart We've entered into the courts with praise. We sing the sins the day that the Lord has made. Gonna rejoice cause Jesus made me glad. Sing it with me now. Jesus made me glad. Oh, my Lord made me glad. Gonna rejoice cause Jesus made me glad. Made me glad. Oh, my Lord made me glad. I'm gonna rejoice. Call Jesus. Can you give him a hand? Somebody say hallelujah. Praise God. You know, this is the resurrection. I want to know him in the power of his resurrection, Paul said. I've known him in the fellowship of his suffering, his conforming unto his way, his death, because suffering with him is given not just to reign with him, but to suffer with him, and they that suffer with him shall also reign with him. So it's the power of his resurrection. Hallelujah. He resurrected from the dead, and today he denotes that wonderful time of the resurrection. Somebody say hallelujah. Somebody say praise the Lord. Let's give him another hand. Hallelujah, 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 hallelujah. What a day that'll be. And 10,000 times, 10,000 and thousands of saints, everything in heaven, everything in the earth, everything beneath the earth begins to say hallelujah. Hosanna to God, glory to God in the highest. Hallelujah, praise and honor be unto him forever. You can be seated. It's a wonderful occasion to be here uh, on a Sunday morning, especially at this time, you know, knowing that God is here with us and uh, knowing that you are the children of God. There's no greater privilege, no greater privilege than being a Christian. Being a son of God and being about your father's business, sons and daughters and children of God, the family of God. Mary came one time uh, looking for Jesus and she wanted to know where her son was and he said, they said, Jesus, your mother wants to see you, your brethren. He said, who is my mother and who is my brethren? These that do the will of my father, which is in heaven. So you're his family. You're the God family this morning like the song we wrote, The Family of God. You're the God family, and that makes you the great, wonderful, royal family, kings and priests in the earth. And, um, you know, we was talking about the will of God yesterday, and uh, we teach the will of God is faith, as you very well know, because God is the Word, and making himself subject to faith, he is... Pardon me, he is the God of faith. He's the great mighty God of faith and he is. Martin Luther made a statement one time that was a great statement that I really didn't know he made until yesterday. Somebody had brought a book on Reformation. Everything was just right about that time for him to present that. And it was reading a little article concerning that. We call him the Reformer 
and he was the one that broke loose from the Catholic Church in the early uh, years of our father's frontier efforts. And, um, and he taught that the just should live by faith. So he made a statement that he that hath faith hath everything, and he that doth not have faith, he doesn't have anything. And that's right, because God is the God that works through faith. And uh, the thing that we're concerned about is that the just should live by faith. And it is another time of reformation, but it is also a time of resurrection. It's a time of the saints of God coming in. Whereas the Bible said, and Satan shall wear out the saints of God, and then even after he wears them out, that they shall rise and take the kingdom and possess it forever and forever. So then, this morning, we'd like to dwell on that for just a little bit. Talk about the faith and the power of the resurrection. For this morning, it's going back to what we use, where we use the terms, now is come power. Now is come power. And, and sometimes that's kind of foreign to some of us when we talk like that. We don't quite get a hold of those kind of things. Now it's come power. But first of all, let's just analyze one or two little things here. And one thing is, why is it that in the world today, though we have many Christians and we have many people in the world today that are religious, the world is filled with them all over the world. Not necessarily filled with Christians, but there are many Christians in the world. But filled with religious people. So then, why is it that we have so many Christians and uh, some of them seem devoted? But why is it that we do not have very many people in the world today or ever have had during the history of mankind that had power with God? Why is it that we have Christians and yet we don't have Christians that really have the power with God as if they should have it or as it should be in the church world today. Why is that? You know, you get baffled at it because you think, well, I am a Christian, and I know that I'm a Christian. Whereas the Bible said, if you're born to the Spirit, then walk in the Spirit. So you can be born to the Spirit, but you need to walk in the Spirit. And then another thing is, pray that God will grant unto you the Spirit of Revelation. Let us go on unto perfection not turning again to lay the foundation of repentance and of dead works before God, but going on to perfection. Let us go on to perfection. Get away from repentance to the extent that it isn't that we're going to leave repentance and not repent when we do wrong, but rather being habitual as repentance is wrong. That is, we just do things and use repentance as a crutch so that we can always say, well, we're sorry. We didn't mean to do that. We explode. We let our temper go. We have the, an attitude through life that's not right. And uh, we just do things that are wrong. We're constantly doing things that are wrong. We are evasive toward the Word of God and conforming to the Word of God. And we add little things here and there all the time. We get into the things of the world and we are noticing the things of the world on every scale of life. And then we say, well, we're sorry. We didn't mean to do it. God forgive us. I know you love us. Grace is with us. All this is true. You know grace is with you. And right now you're in the church ages. The blood is on the mercy seat. And just as sure as you live, though you do that thing, you're going to find grace. But we've got to remember that even though you do find grace as a Christian, terror, the terror as well as the wheat finds the sunshine and the rain coming down upon it. Or that is to say the wicked, they have grace just like you have grace. And as long as that blood is on the mercy seat, they're going to have it. So it really doesn't mean anything to the extent of salvation. Though you might say, well, I have grace. I know that God loves me and I know that God is with me and I know that God has forgiven me and that is true. It is true. But that doesn't mean that you have salvation. And it doesn't mean you're going to heaven. And because you feel his presence coming around, it doesn't mean that you've been born again. So then the rain is on the just and on the unjust. And the Bible said it is so close, so knitted together so closely, that it would deceive the very elect if it was possible. So then that means that 
you know, you cannot tell the difference in this age that we're living in, this religious age. But when the blood comes off of the seat of mercy, you're going to tell the difference. Because those that are children of darkness and those that belong to Satan, that are sons and daughters of Satan, they're suddenly going to show up in the darkness. And it's going to show that they are darkness and that you children of God are light. And the darkness is going to be accounted for as the light being accounted for. And that is light will be accounted for as the wonderful mind of Christ and the understanding of Christ and the revelational mind that God has given. And darkness will be accounted for as the diplomacy of the world and the educational system and the human, religion, uh, human reasoning and human brilliance of the world. Because the contest is between these two of the tree of knowledge and the tree of life. Jesus said, my words are spirit and they are life. But then the tree of knowledge is death. To be carnally minded is death. And the day that thou eatest of that tree, Adam and Eve, ye shall surely die. And the generations have come down through Adam, through the fall of the beast and being subjected to the serpent, coming down as a generation unto death. And in Adam all die. So then when we come to the gospel, we come to what we call the resurrection. You know, it's like I told someone the other day. I said, you know, I, I could tell the person was talking real negative about something and I was chatting with him just a little bit. And I said, you know, I said, if going to church is all there is to religion, to me, you know, that's really repulsive, folks, just to have to go to church when I could do a lot of other things. And I said, if just repenting uh, and talking about the Bible and these kind of things, I was expressing in my own words, if this is all there is to the gospel, then that's repulsive. See, because it only makes me to know something that I can't do, that I don't want to do, I have no desire to do, Unless I am born again with the Spirit of God on the inside of me, having a hunger and a thirst after the things of God. And I said, if this is all there is to it, then there is nothing to it as far as I'm concerned. I said, and when we talk about God, we're talking about the resurrection. We're talking about the life. We're talking about living again. I said, we're talking about defeating death. I said, this is what the gospel is for. The gospel is that Jesus Christ came to deliver me from death. And of course, I was talking to somebody recently about their companion and talking to them about the condition. And uh, they, were, they were all torn up over, which is normal. Uh, the companion just about uh, on the verge of dying. But I asked this question. I said, now the question I'd like to ask is this. Is it God's will for this person to live? And, uh, you know, people sometimes when you ask them questions like that, they're baffled and they really don't know how to answer you. <laughs> but you say, a person is dying, is it God's will for them to die? Or is it God's will for them to live? Well, then you say, well, I really don't know. I don't know. I'm going to pray for them. But I really don't know. You know, it just comes a time when you have to die. Well, folks, unless we can better understand the situation, we're never going to have any blessings from God. Until we can understand the will of God, Satan is going to make havoc out of the church, and we're going to perish. The Bible said my people perish from the lack of knowledge, and it certainly isn't from the lack of the knowledge of the world and the technicalities of the world because they know a lot about technology. But it is from the lack of the knowledge of Almighty God. Solomon said, search, keep searching, and you'll find the wisdom and knowledge of God. The Bible said the heavens declare his handiwork, and the earth is full of the knowledge of God. So then, when you get into the Spirit, everything begins to witness to you, and as David of old, God said, David... When you hear the rustling in the mulberry trees, you know the move is on. And just through the whirlwind of the trees, then God spoke to David. So then we know, we know that God has a program and God has a plan. 
And that plan we must know and we must understand or we'll perish at the hand of the devil since he is such a brilliant thing in the world today. So in the modern fields of technology, we see a lot of things happening. But in the church, we want to see what's happening in the spiritual world. They that are spiritual see these things. Paul said, I would that you were spiritual. You're, you're carnal. There's envy and strife and malice. You're struggling for the things of the world. You're making provisions for the flesh to fulfill the lust and the desire of the flesh. He said, are you not yet children? He said, you're still in a novice state as to ministers. But he said, I would that you were spiritual. I'd like to speak unto you as unto spirituals. He said, for God is a spirit. God, the invisible God whom I serve with my spirit. Jesus said to the woman at the well, woman, you worship, you know not what. For God is a spirit. And they that worship God must worship him in spirit and in truth. My words are spirit and they are life. So then the first man Adam was made a living soul, but the second man Adam was a quickening spirit. When a person is a living soul, they're no more than a beast. When you are a living soul, you're no more than a beast. Because that's what a beast is. A beast has a soul. See, but the thing is, you've got to go beyond that. The second man Adam was not a living soul. The second man Adam was made a quickening spirit. And when you are a living soul, you don't really have life. Someone would say, well, I'm as much alive as I'll ever be. And Brother Pike, I can assure you I've got plenty of life. But I can assure you that you're not much alive, that you're dead in trespasses and sin while you yet think that you live. And that you do not have life. You only have the breath of life. And God has entrusted to you the breath of life to see what you will do with the breath of life before he entrusts to you the true riches, which is life. Because if he gives you life, then he cannot take that from you. That is a gift from God, whereas he vows he'll never take it away from you, that it will be eternal. So he will not entrust that life to you until he has first proven you and the first man Adam and his generation is to prove who will be worthy to receive life by allowing them to have the breath of life and to see what they will do with their stewardship and what they will do with this breath of life. So then he gives grace. He gives the blood on the seed of mercy not just to you but to all the world that during the church ages, everybody may have a chance to hear the gospel, get their eyes open, their eyes of understanding to the extent that they can repent of their sins and come to God and find strength to be able to be born again. After that, the light will go out. The great light of God will be gone. The blood will come off of the mercy seat. The church ages will close. The veil will not be rent then, and the door will be closed, and darkness, gross darkness, which means intellectual ignorance and brilliance of the world, will take over the beast, which means spiritual understanding or godly inclination. So then they will be cut out because they are people of diplomacy and people of intellect, and there won't even be as much as any healing medicines. Their brilliance will turn into foolishness. And they'll find out that they can't even uh, bring healing to one another. So then we see these wonderful things that God has done. And we see that God is the God of life. He said, I am the Prince of life. I've come that you might have life and that you might have it more abundant, which means filled up and overflowing. And as I was talking to this person about their loved one uh, and questioning in them as to what the will of God was, I asked you the same question is it God's will for people to die? Is it God's will for people to die? You know, like some was talking to uh, this particular person, and they said, well, there is a sickness unto death. You have to remember that. That's the consolation they were offering him, and I'm sure that they meant well in doing that, but kind of like Job's miserable confidence, they meant well too. But they didn't understand so they said there's a sickness under death you know you just have to accept this and the doctors were saying well let them die in dignity you know but the thing is when the medical world fails that's God's opportunity 
And even though we use these things for aid, that doesn't mean that we're going to go down to Egypt for our help when it comes to our faith and entrusting our faith to these things and have a misplaced faith. We're trusting God. He's kept us through the years. He'll continue to do that. They that wait upon the Lord shall renew their strength, shall mount up with the wings of eagle. They shall run and not be weary. They shall walk and not faint. So then, like the eagle that beats the crust off of his head when he begins to age, he renews his youth. And then he starts all over again. So it is a beautiful thing to see that Christ Jesus did exactly what the eagle did. He beat the crust of the intellectual off of his head. The children of God, beat, they beat the intellectual crust off of their head. And it reminds me of what the eagle does to the serpent. I seen a film one time and I saw this film as the eagle come down. I could see the shadow coming down after a serpent that was racing for the hole. The shadow of the eagle was over him and then the camera showed the serpent trying to get into the hole before the eagle got him. But the eagle caught him and when he caught him he raised him up and he went near a stone and he kept beating his head on that stone until he killed the serpent. So that's what we do. The soul body is born to the serpent. The soul body comes through the fall. The soul body comes through that of the weakness of the beast. And the soul body is on its belly. For the Bible said he's put the serpent on his belly and called him a generation of vipers. And he said all of your labors for your belly and for your mouth because it craves it of you. And so then in self-denial we overcome the body we deny the body because the body is contrary. Oh, wretched man that I am, who shall deliver me from this contrary body or this body of death, Paul said. For within the flesh there is no good thing, for her will is present, but how to perform that which is good I find not. And the flesh lusteth under envy, for all flesh hath corrupted its way before God, and there is none good, no, not one. All have gone astray, and the Lord has laid upon Jesus Christ the iniquity of us all. And he was bruised for our transgression, and the chastisement of our peace was upon him, by whose stripes we're healed. So then, we beat the soul intellectual head until we break the crust, and then we come forth in a new birth, being born again, we come forth in a new strength. And like the eagle, we mount up into the wonderful heavenlies. And instead of finding as to that which contest is our strength, in that the wind and the forces come against us, instead of finding that as to a defeat, we find that as to a benefit. We spread our wings and we ride upon the wind. And as the wind comes against us and the turbulence and the resistance, we use it for a stepping stone and just glide above it as it goes under the wings and get higher and higher into the heavens. Whereas the other little birds have to kind of tuck their heads and the wind pushes them down and they have to look for a place of safety or crash into the trees. So then you're like eagles. You're great and mighty in God. You have the great mighty wingspan of the eagle as we say. You're powerful and you're able to do that. And God likens America to the eagle. She chooses the eagle for her bird, the great mighty bald eagle, which is her state bird or her bird. And this great mighty eagle can fly higher than most any other bird that there is. And his eyes are sharp and piercing and he can see things for miles off. He makes his nest in the rocks way up above everything to where nothing can get to him. So this is what we're working on today. We're trying to beat the old crust off. We're born into this world and eventually we come to a place of intellectual reasoning when we leave our innocency of childhood. We come to the knowledge of right and wrong and where there's a knowledge of sin, sin is imputed. If there is no knowledge of sin, then the sin is not imputed. Therefore, death cannot come. But just as quick as we get a knowledge of sin, then sin is imputed and death comes because the transgression of the law is sin. Therefore, death comes because sin is the sting of death. So then we see that we have a need for a savior. You know, the law came to the Jews and the law is still in the world today. Though we 
accredited it to the Jews, and we don't think of it as having to do with the Gentiles. But, beloved friend, let me tell you, the law has to do with the Gentiles too. So the law shall not pass away till every jot and every tittle is fulfilled. And Jesus came into the world to fulfill every jot and every tittle of the law only for those that would believe on him. And he went to Calvary and he fulfilled every jot and every tittle. He folded it up and it passed away. And today you're not under the law, so you're not under sin and you're not under the curse. And therefore you're not under death. Because the transgression of the law being sin, the sting of sin is death. And where there's no law, there's no transgression. Where there's no transgression, there is no sin. And where there's no sin, there is no sting of death. O oh, death, where is thy sting? And grave, where do you get your victory since there's no more sting to death? So then we, we realize that the Lord came to deliver that is from death. Well, when we talk about God's will as to whether it's his will for man to die or not to die, what do we find? Do, does God give his will to his enemy? Is death therefore the friend of God or is it the enemy of God? Is it Satan that is the thief and a robber and steals by death and by the treacherous things that he doth? Does God give his strength to death? Or does he repel death? Did he fight death until he emptied the blood out of his veins to put a stop to it? Is this why he came to Calvary? So then they said unto the man, they said, and there is a sickness unto death. I said, where is that at? I would like for somebody to read that to me. I said, I'd like for him to show it to me in the Bible. I said, there is no such teachings. When somebody tells you that, I said, there's no such teaching. The Bible does not say there is a sickness unto death. There is no such teachings. No more than the word rapture that they use. It's not there. So then there's no sickness unto death. And them telling that weak person that was enough to crush the faith or a person that was trying to believe for them. I said, there is no such teachings. I said, the Bible said there is a sin unto death. I do not say that ye shall pray for that, but no sickness unto death. All sickness is of the devil, and God is ready to overthrow it. He came into the world healing all that was oppressed of the devil. Christ Jesus did, for God was with him, going about doing good. So then, I said, there is no sickness unto death. But somebody else says, well... You've got to remember one thing. And they gave another supposed consolation. They said it's appointed unto man wants to die. You have to remember that. So they're just going to die at some time or another. I said if that is true. And I said it is true that the Bible does say. That it's appointed unto man wants to die. And after that the judgment. I said but if it's true that it's appointed unto man wants to die and that appointment still stands, then Christ Jesus came to Calvary in vain. I said, it's no good to us. He wasted his time and our time too, because if the appointment with death is still there, and I must meet an appointment with death, and I'm a Christian, then the Lord died in vain. For the purpose of coming to Calvary was that he might conquer death and do away with his enemy death and to take it away from his people. And lift the curse, for he said, I am the prince of life, and I've come that you might have life, and that you might have it more abundant. The enemy comes, but to be a thief, a thief and a robber, he comes to steal and to kill, but I come to give you life filled up and overflowing. So then he said, I am the prince of life. I said, What do you do with the scripture? For the Bible said, and God looked down from heaven, heard the groaning of the prisoners, and loosed them that was appointed unto death. And in a day accepted, he succored them. I said, that was Calvary. I said, he broke the appointment. I don't have any appointment with death. 
And you that are Christians have no appointment with the death because you have passed from death unto life. Let's give him a hand. He did it all. He did it all. Hallelujah. He did it all. And he broke the bonds of iniquity and set you free that you'd never have to die saying that you've passed from death unto life and shall never come into condemnation. For there is now therefore no condemnation to them that are in Christ Jesus that they should appear before the judgment to be condemned. They've been judged already in the house of God. It's the place of judgment and your sins have been remitted through the ministry and you are free. But there is an appointment unto death under the law for them that have not been born again, for they that have fallen from grace are under the law. So then the law is still at large to them. And they've got to face the appointment and they've got to face death. But the Lord Jesus died for us and the Bible said, Therefore, reckon yourself to be dead indeed unto sin. That is, against the transgression of the law. Be dead as to the transgression of the law by the body of the Lord Jesus Christ. For where there's no law, there is no transgression. And where there's no transgression, there is no sin, in that sin is the transgression of the law. And where there is no sin, there is no death, in that sin is the sting of death. And you've been delivered from sin. For he that is born of God cannot sin. Let's give the Lord another hand. So then you made the righteousness of God which is in Christ Jesus, even the righteousness of God which is the faith of Christ Jesus. So then we are delivered from death and the resurrection as it is denoted this morning shows this wonderful thing and if we had the time this morning, you had the time we would go into a present day revelation of what's happening and the fact that two flags are flying out there today one being the Jewish flag and one being our flag. And of course, the Jewish flag having a great significance in that we've not flown the Jewish flag since I brought the one from Israel. And uh, all of a sudden, we're flying the Jewish flag on this resurrectional morning. And then another thing, the flag that's flying is the one that was put on Sister Young's casket when she was taken to the Carolinas and we spoke of it and what it had to do with, with the youth and the crossing of the Jordan is to the day. What this had to do with, with Calvary is to the crossing of the Jordan or the Joshua that went in and took the people over the Jordan into the promised land. Promised land, 32,000 promises they say that's in the Bible toward this wonderful land as we say. So then having a promise from God, the time of the promise drew near. And so here we are coming down to the end of the church ages and the great wonderfulness of God is being revealed in the mysteries of God coming forward that we should know that we should never die, that we are children of the resurrection. You know, one thing that fascinated me about Jesus when he stood by the tomb of Lazarus, I know some of you have been there with me and stood by the tomb of Lazarus. It's a deep, deep place. And uh, you'd have problems down there hearing somebody hollering from the top unless they hollered good and loud. But nevertheless, having gone down the little stairway down there, it's real deep. And I thought about Jesus standing up at the top of that and calling to Lazarus. When Mary and Martha came crying, they were weeping over the brother. And as they did that, Jesus, he was brokenhearted and he wept with them. He felt their infirmities. You know, he came down in the body to feel our infirmities. That's the greatness of our high priest. He can feel our infirmities, be touched by the feeling of our infirmities. And he wanted to know exactly what you were subject to. So God made himself a body and come down and feel, to feel those infirmities, to be able to judge us in, in the right kind of way and have compassion. And there Jesus having compassion, it broke his heart as he saw hit them that he loved weeping and he wept with them. The Bible said he wept. So then he said, that's all right, your brother will live again. And they said, well, we know that he will live again. We know that. In the resurrection, he will live again. But you know the beauty of what Jesus said? He said, but I am the resurrection. I am the resurrection. Hallelujah. You know, I know my brother's going to live again in the resurrection. But Jesus said, glory to God, as we would say, it's already come. 
It's already come. Can you believe that? And I will appear the second time without sin unto salvation to them that look for me. The world shall not see me, but ye shall see me, for I shall be in you. For I am the resurrection and I am the life. He that believeth on me is passed from death unto life and shall never come into condemnation. Somebody say hallelujah. So then that means you are children of the resurrection. For Jesus said, I am the resurrection. And this morning he is with us. He is resurrected from the dead. He is with us. And every time we come to the house of God, we are reminded of that. We are here to stir up our pure mind, which is the mind of Christ, that we might win out in this contest as to the dispute over the body, for we are looking for the redemption of the body. The body is the purchased possession and purchased with his blood at Calvary, but it has not come to his chains yet. But the spiritual inner man has come to his chains. As to the translation of the spirit, he has come to translation into the marvelous spirit of Christ. Your angel, your inner angel translated into the angel of Christ as of the kingdom of God within you. And now you're going through your schooling as to a diplomacy, toward a diplomacy as to the transformation of the mind. Therefore, being transformed by the renewing of your mind, we're moving toward this wonderful ultimatum with this heavenly treasure that we already have in our earthen vessels may be made manifest in our mortal genes, that it might bring about a transfiguration, which is the change of the body, which is not eternal life. We already have eternal life, but it will be immortality. But now it's brought to light immortality. At last, God has brought to light that he does not want people to be put in a casket. Death is not the friend of God, is the enemy of God. And that he hath conquered death, and though it's the last one to be conquered as to the world, yet it has already been conquered by you through Christ Jesus. And that you are not, God is not designed that you be put in a casket. It is not his will for men to die. I said then, is it God's will for the person to die? <laughs> is it God's will for any person to die with any kind of sickness at any kind of age? No. No. I said it's never his will for death. Never. It's not his will when you die of old age. It's not his will. That's because of sin and the disobedience of man. And death came by man, not by God. So then through faith we can correct it. And as I said to the individual, I said, we are not in, the, in question as to God's will. I said his word is his will. Faith by his word is his will. According to your faith, so be it unto you. I said, so we're not in question about that. I said, it's not a matter of us finding out <clears throat> whether it's God's will. And I said, it's not a matter as to finding out who this applies to you. For he said, what I say to one I said to all, I said as to this person that seems to be dying, if they are a villain and they have sinned and they're dying because of that, I said, why is it you're not dying? I said, why is it I'm not dying? I said, the Bible said, all flesh is corrupted this way before God. There's none good. No, not one. And if God would spare us, saying as to one what I say, I say to all, I said then if he would not consider that person to be the villain, that is to you to be the villain or me to be the villain, why well, consider that person to be the villain and kill them because of their sins when the Bible said the prayer of faith shall save the sick and if they've committed any sins it shall be forgiven them. I said, you know what it is? It's not a matter of God's will. I said, it's a matter of us having enough faith to believe in God so God can work his will. That's where the problem is, is in mankind So then, why is it that not very many people have the power of God? A lot of Christians in the world today, a lot of religious people. Why don't they have the power of God? Someone would say, well, doesn't a Christian have the power of God? They certainly do. Well, when you receive the Holy Ghost, you shall receive power. So then the Holy Ghost is the power over all the powers of the enemy. Behold, I give you power over all the powers of the enemy, and nothing shall by any means hurt you. He that is born of God keepeth himself, and the evil one touches them not. Why then is it like it is? A being in the Spirit, born of the Spirit, not walking in the Spirit, 
not subjecting the body, a virtuous woman's prize is far beyond that of rubies as to us being in the feminine gender as to God's glory. So then, why is that? You know, it's kind of like this. If you use a little simple illustration to be able to understand it, if I had several sons and one was about 12 years old and one was about 14 years old and one was about 21 years old, and I had a high-powered rifle, and I liked to hunt. And my sons was taking up the same characteristics. And if the little 12-year-old come and said, Dad, I want that high-powered rifle. I want to go hunting. I'd be reluctant to let him have it. And if the little 14-year-old come, I'd feel better, but I'd still be reluctant to let him have it. But if the 21-year-old came and said, Well, Dad, I've been with you all these years. I've listened carefully to you, and I know your mind. I know how to be careful. I certainly wouldn't harm anybody. And I'll handle this thing just right, Dad, if you'll just commit that to my trust. I'd say, you know, I think I can do it. Folks, that's where the problem is. See, we're children of God, but we've got to come to the bar mitzvah. And we've got to come to the development, going on to the full measure of the full stature of the full reward. Therefore, he'll commit this to our trust. He doesn't commit power to the trust of very many because they're not developed, they're not withdrawn from the world, it's not safe to let them have it. It's like James and John said, shall we call down fire on them and we'll just consume them. We'll have a temper and we'll pray to God that God will take their heads off. You know, that's the way they were in the Old Testament. He's my enemy. I'll take his head off. Solomon said, I'm going to give you wisdom like no man's ever had. I'm going to give you riches like no man has ever had, ever had or ever will. He said, I'm going to give it to you, he said, because you have not asked the life of your enemies. You have not asked for riches, but asked for wisdom to guide my people. And he did. He gave it to him. And you know, folks, we develop, God will give you the power. He wants you to have the power, but power comes from having a conscience fought of offense toward man and God, doing the things always as Jesus did that pleased God. And Enoch, before his translation, had this testimony that he pleased God. Without faith, it's impossible to please God, that is, believing in the Word, conforming to the Word. And like Martin Luther one time said, when a person really has faith, they begin to die out to the world. They begin to make a change in their body. They become kings and priests unto God so then that means that we should understand that God isn't going to entrust this thing to us until we develop so very few is going to have this wonderful power but if we give ourselves wholly unto God a reasonable sacrifice as a daily sacrifice and a reasonable service he'll give it he'll give us that power he'll give it unto us he'll entrust it unto us Let's stand together. I appreciate your kind attention. The hold it along as best I can. Just to have a little conference with you and try to exalt you a little more as I see the day approaching. The time is getting closer and closer. Brother Richard, the Jew, came to me yesterday, I believe it was, kind of alarmed, and he said, you know, said this thing don't figure up right. I said, well, what is that, Richard? He said, well, he said, this thing figures up to 1965. So that puts a big gap in there as to the years to bring about the 2000. I said, well, how did you figure it, according to the Roman calendar? And he said, uh, yeah. I said, it won't work out like that. The Bible said, Antichrist will seek to change the times and the seasons which he has done through his brilliance of what he calls technology. And God allowed that so that we wouldn't know the day nor the hour of his coming. And so that Satan couldn't find that out. But at the same time, I said, Richard, you'll have to go back to the Jewish calendar, which, of course, is the prophetical calendar, the one that, that we have reference to. For the Bible said, prophecy is the testimony of Christ. That's Christ himself testifying. And his word will be true. His testimony will be true. His prophecy will be true. It shows that as to the prophetical utterance that came in the early days according to 
Palm Sunday as we call it, that it came to pass almost to the very day according to that calendar, the prophetic calendar. And uh, if you really narrowed it down, you'd find it on the very day. So he went back and he refigured, and when he refigured it according to the prophetical calendar, he said, oh, there is a difference. He said instead of 65, he said it narrows it down to where there's only six years. said it comes down to 94. And said that's close enough for me. He didn't try to figure it on down. But anyway, it means that it is close. It is close. It is close at hand. When you see these things come to pass, know that it's not even at the door. Well, let's sing a little course together, brother. Jesus has the table spread where the saints of God are fed. He invites the chosen people come and dine. There they found their heart's desire, bread and fish upon the fire. Thus he satisfies the hungry every time. Come and dine. And come and dine. You can feast at Jesus' table all the time. You who fed the multitudes and the waters in the wine to the hungry calling now. Come and dine. Come and dine. My master's calling. Come and dine. You can feast at Jesus' table all the time. He who fed the multitudes turned the waters into wine. To the hungry calling now, come and die. The disciples came to land, thus obeying Christ's command. He called to them to come and die. There they found their heart's desire, bread and fish upon the fire. Thus he satisfied the hungry every time. Come and dine, my master's calling, come and dine. You can feast at Jesus' table all the time. He who fed the multitudes turned the water into wine. To the hungry calling now, come and die. Soon the lamb will take his bride to be at his side. All oh, the host of heaven will assemble be. Oh, it will be a glorious sight. All of the saints in spotless white, they will feast with Jesus then eternally. Come and dine. Oh, you can feast at Jesus' table all the time. He who fed the multitude turned the waters into wine. The altars are open if you'd like to come and dine. Come and dine, my master's calling. Come and dine. Can you hear him? Feast at Jesus' table all the time. And he who fed the multitude turned the waters into wine to the hungry calling now. Sing it one more time with me. Come and dine, my master's calling. Come and dine. Can we all just kind of come down to the altar today? It would be good having to do with the resurrection. I know you want to be in that number when the saints go marching in. I'd hate not to be in that number. You know, let everything that had breath praise the Lord. God, remember me when you come into your kingdom, the thief said at Calvary. And I pray the old God, remember me. What a day that's going to be. God, remember me. I remembered. Let's lift our hands up and love him. Can we love him? Can we love him? God inhabits the praise of his people. He inhabits the praise of his people this morning. Let's lift our hands up and let's praise him. And let's just everybody come down to the altar this morning.
rededicate our lives and our hearts and give God a chance at our souls this morning to tell him how much we love him, how much he means to us so that he'll remember us. If we remember him, he'll remember us. Draw nigh to God and he'll draw nigh to you. You can feast at Jesus' table all the time to turn the waters into wine. Let's sing it again, can we? Come and dine, my master's calling, come and dine. Oh, you can feast at Jesus' table all the time. He who fed the multitude turned the waters into wine. Let's sing this verse over. Soon that lamb will take his bride to be ill at his side all oh, the host of heaven will assemble be can't you just see the angels the angels are going to be waving hallelujah they're going to say that beautiful bride of Christ hallelujah hallelujah isn't she beautiful isn't she beautiful without spot without wrinkle without blemish would you want to miss that folks would you want to miss that let's give him a wave offering Let's give him a wave offering. Can you lift your hand? Can you close your eyes and worship the Lord? Hungry is calling now. Come and dine. Lift them hands. Close your eyes. Come and dine. Oh, you can feast at Jesus' table all the time. May who fed the most. this production, we trust that your heart has been inspired, your understanding enlightened, and your faith strengthened by the hearing of these words of life. We want to thank all of you who have stood with us in your prayers, finance, and labor, thus fulfilling the commandment to love the Lord with all of your heart, soul, mind, and strength, and to love your neighbor as yourself. We invite you who are hearing the revelation of Jesus Christ for the first time to become a partner with us in this worldwide ministry for Christ. If you would like to receive more information and a sample of our literature, then write us a letter. Our address is Jesus Christ, Eternal Kingdom of Abundant Life, P.O. Box 986, Monroe, Georgia, 30655, USA. Or you can call us at 770-267-7483 Monday through Friday during regular business hours in the Eastern Time Zone. And finally, you will find our very extensive website at www.jceal.org. Until we meet again, may the Lord richly bless you.